Hey guys, I'm Chris Buck and a very warm welcome to Friday Fretworks. And this week we're taking a look at the reasons why I may have just bought a Clon Centaur. Is it brilliant or am I brainless? <laughs> It's another video about the Clon Centaur, the most talked about, polarizing, divisive, revered, mythological, whatever you want to call it, pedal of all time. Now, for anyone that knows me knows that I'm a big fan of the Clon sound, and over the last 10 years or so, I've used any number of Clon type pedals, clones, if you will, on my pedal board. All started with the JHS clone about 10 years ago, but more recently, it's been either the Clon KTR or the Chariot Tone Centura. Now, I've been very fortunate to spend enough time with a few original clones over the years to come to the conclusion that save for one or two very subtle differences, which may or may not come down to component tolerance differences, there's not enough of a difference between the original and a few of the very good clones that are available to justify the insane prices that they've now reached. For reference, when I last made a video about the clone in November of 2019, they just started grazing £2,000, a point at which many people believed that surely this madness couldn't go on and this was as high as they would ever reach. Fast forward to 2021 and they've just started grazing £4,000. That's a 100% increase in a year and three and four months. It's absolutely insane. So why on earth have I bought one now? For those uninitiated, the Centaur is an overdrive pedal, and quite frankly, it's always been expensive. When it was introduced in 1994 by Bill Finnegan, its co-designer, under the brand name Clon, or Clon Siberia, it retailed at $225, which in today's money, say for a few cents, is $400. Even with today's thriving boutique pedal market, you'll struggle to find any pedals in that price range, never mind overdrive pedals with only three knobs. Now, Bill estimates that in the 15 or so years that the pedal was in production, he manufactured 8,000 of them by hand, roughly at a rate of about one and a half a day, all made on a folding table across various apartments in his native Boston. Now, believe it or not, even during the time that the pedal was in production, second-hand prices had already started to rise, as those unwilling to wait the two or three months that it took Bill to turn a pedal around turned to the second-hand market. And by the time the pedal was discontinued in 2009, the stage was well and truly set for the Clon Centaur to become the most revered mythical overdrive pedal of all time. <laughs> Why the Clon Centaur? Now, underlying all of its mythological status is the fact that, at heart, it sounds good. It's a great sounding overdrive pedal. And unlike a lot of pedals which emerged in this era, it is a totally original design that was very much at the forefront of the transparent overdrive boom that we've experienced in the last few years. So the story goes that its co-designer Bill Finnegan, disillusioned with the compression, the mid-hump and the bass and high-end roll-off of the Tube Screamer, set about designing a pedal that would make his twin reverb sound more open 
at lower volumes for the smaller clubs that he was playing in Boston without fundamentally changing its tone. That is the crucial element. Of course, the irony in all of this being that the Klon actually has a very distinctive mid-range, which, quite frankly, is one of the reasons it sounds so good. After a few years of prototyping designs with a friend from MIT, the Centaur finally went into production in 1994. And despite its relatively high price and the fact that the designer was unknown in the grand scheme, it very quickly gathered a devout following and, needless to say, wasn't long until it found its way into the hands of a wealth of great players. Whether we're talking Peter Frampton, Joe Bonamassa, Joe Perry, Jeff Beck, John Mayer and Keith Urban to name but a few. Looking at the settings of those players, it's interesting to see that, to a man, they're all using the Clone Centaur as Bill Finnegan intended, as an overdrive pedal. Now, this may sound rather strange, but in more recent years, the Clone Centaur's reputation has primarily centered around its use as a clean boost, or its capabilities as a clean boost, a way of fattening up your clean sound without adversely affecting its tone. Now, bizarrely, given this is, as I said, primarily where its reputation lies today, the interesting thing is, is that used as such, it's not even touching the mythical Germanian clipping diodes, which, as Bill Finnegan pointed out in the later iteration of the Centaur, the KTR, is really where the magic of the pedal lies. Josh Scott from JHS explains this in this clip. And I like the position where I use it for a demo as well, because we know we're hearing the diode. If you roll this gain off, you don't even hear the diode. So there's a, there's a really great humor in the fact of, I see a lot of people saying, I hear this, the special diode. And then you look at their board, they're using it as a clean boost, and the diode's not even activated because you have to push enough gain across the threshold of the diode to even get it to clip. So if you're running your Klon down here, you're not hearing a diode. So you could, t and I will do this at some point, I'll just take pliers and cut a diode, the diodes out of a Klon to yes, prove this point. Out of a real Klon. Might as well. Come on. And then... But when you're here, you really do hear it. Ironically, Bill Finnegan appeared at NAMM in 2016, armed with an unnamed prototype, a clone unnamed prototype, which by his own admission was very much centered around the Centaur's functionality as a clean boost. As of 2021, the pedal has yet to materialize. And to be honest, the clone saga these days is more centered around the KTR's availability and whether it is or isn't in production anymore. Either way, I think there's no disagreeing that whether you use the Centaur as a clean boost or as an overdrive, Sounds pretty good.
as good as the Centaur undeniably is, its sound goes nowhere near explaining why. Currently, depending on design, colour and condition, a Centaur will set you back between three and four thousand pounds, generally speaking. Now, over the last ten years or so, there have been countless efforts made to clone the Clon, and to a large degree, have proven that it is entirely possible to nail its vibe. And even if the unusual aesthetic is what you're after, then the Cherry Tone Centura very much nails that niche. So why the hype? Firstly, it's rarity. Now, there are actually quite a lot of parallels that can be drawn between a 1959 Les Paul, the Burst, and the Clon Centaur, handmade by skilled craftsmen in relatively low quantities, and would only really go on to make their significant mark long after they were out of production. Of course, much like a 59 Burst, the fact that there have been so many attempts to clone the Clon over the years only really adds to the perception that we've still not nailed it and there is something truly magical about those original units. Not forgetting, of course, that for the long longest time, up until 2009 actually, nobody had the foggiest idea what was actually in the Clone Centaur, with Bill Finnegan of course having covered the original circuit board in a black epoxy resin. Goop. Now, even when this was reverse engineered in 2009 and someone finally managed to remove the goop, Bill Finnegan's claims that they misidentified one or two key components only really added to the myth surrounding the Centaur. Secondly, it's become something of a status symbol for guitar players. Any piece of discontinued gear that goes on to be used in a high-profile way by musicians becomes the piece of gear to have or the piece of gear to be seen with on your pedal board, as bizarre as concept as that may seem. There have been countless precedents set for this over the years, whether we're talking David Gilmore on the original Big Muff, Stevie Ray Vaughan, of course, the TS-808 Tube Screamer, or more recently, John Mayer and the TS-10. Not forgetting that the TS-10, for many years after its release, was much maligned and castigated as a lesser tube screamer. It's a relatively simple equation. Demand goes up, supply goes down. And this is none more true than in the case of the Clone Centaur. Lastly, and arguably most pivotal in the reason for the drastic recent price hike of the Clone Centaur, is the fact that it's now seen as an investment, and a relatively sound one at that. In much the same way that people balked at the prices of 59 bursts in the 70s when they started reaching upwards of three, four, five thousand dollars $5,000, around fifteen dollars to $20,000 in today's money, it's not unusual to see a burst now reaching upward of two hundred, dollars maybe even $300,000, depending on its provenance and its history. To be honest, the recent arc of the Clone Centaur kind of does mimic that, and to be entirely honest, that is why I've bought mine. One became available through a friend of a friend for a price that, in all honesty, it probably should have been about a year, year and a half ago. So, with some hard-earned savings, I thought it'd be a good investment should a rainy day ever arise, and I needed to part with it. Does it sound that much better than a KTR, or indeed a Chariot Tone Centura? Of course not, but that's not the point. The Klon's legacy has long surpassed that of a simple three-knob overdrive. Much like an original pre-CBS Fender or an original Fuzzface TS-808 or Marshall JTM-45, it's its place in popular culture that dictates its current price and its future prices. And if the arc of the last two, three years of the Klon Centaur is anything to go by, it's frightening to think what prices may reach in several years' time. And even if they don't, at least I'll have a cool overdrive pedal, albeit a hideously overpriced one. As ever, I'm Chris Buck. Thank you very much for watching Friday Fretworks. Please subscribe, hit the bell icon if you haven't already, and I shall see you next week for another episode. Cheers, guys. Take care. I'll see you soon.